Hello, everybody. I'm on time for once, actually. Normally, I'm a bit early, or I'm earlier than this. Let's see what we've got. Perfect. Right, let me just get everybody settled in and then we'll and we'll start if you want to play around with the setting in terms of what you can and can't do if you scroll your mouse you'll see that you've got a chat and a q and a i don't actually mind whether you use chat to ask me a question or put it in the q and a either one works and uh, and we'll just take it from there Okay, so let me share my screen and give you the broad bones of the presentation. Right, here we go, screen sharing. Boom, there we go. You should all be able to see that. Right, I think what I'll do is because we're on time, I'll just crack straight on and those who join later can, uh, can catch up, I suppose. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. And I think from the list of attendees, most of you have been on these things before. If you haven't, quick recap, uh, my name's Phil Bennett. Uh, I run the Gyrocopter Flying Club YouTube channel. And in truth, the main aim of the channel is to talk about all things gyroplane. There's been quite a lot of news flow lately. This webinar is likely to focus on, unfortunately, just lately, quite a bit of doom and gloom if I'm if I'm perfectly honest with you but we'll we'll talk about that slightly uh, in, a, in a moment um, and for those who've just joined I was just recapping who I am and what I do um, I haven't been instructing live this year and actually given the virus that's happened and the lockdowns and so on and so forth in truth it's been quite difficult. I imagine it's been pretty difficult for, for everybody, uh, really. Um, but these kind of events are a reasonable substitute. Right. Let me talk to you about what we're going to cover this evening. Uh, as you can imagine, first on the agenda is what's happening at Autogyro. And for most people, uh, in all territories, and I know attendees to this thing are from the US, uh, also Australia. Autogyro tends to sell well across all markets, although we might suggest they don't sell well enough given their particular predicament. We also cover some recent crashes and some updates as I know them. Then we'll talk about how people can stay safe uh, around emergencies, currency, age, medicals, and so on. The driver for that has come from, I've had quite a lot of questions privately via email where people have seen these recent accidents. And I think there's been about eight fatalities in almost six to, you know, four to six weeks. And, you know, naturally people are concerned. Uh, then we'll touch on techniques around takeoff landings, differences training, We'll talk a little bit about fuel. Uh, not so much making sure you've got enough fuel in the aircraft, although clearly that does make a difference. But most gyroplanes are running on what we would call MOGAS or motor gasoline. And there are some snags with that. And I want to cover the specifics of that and where you can find further reading to educate yourself later. We'll then talk about things to do with buying aircraft and the engine options. And as I suggest at the bottom of this introduction, the Q&A, because of the, of the sheer volume of stuff, and this presentation is, is likely to last at least two hours. So 
uh, if you want to dip in and out, that's the agenda. Uh, we'll probably get to takeoffs and landings about nine o'clock, I would have thought. Uh, you're welcome to, but we'll do the Q&A after each section, because otherwise I think it will just get lost in the, um, in the fullness of time. Okay, let us crack on. So, first thing, what's happening at Autogyro and what my opinion on their next move or where they're going next. I have to be honest, I don't see the future as being particularly great. I've watched their own um, webinar that they did a live stream on YouTube uh, just over a week ago now, I guess. I, I know the current CEO, uh, Jerry Spach, although he hasn't particularly given me any insight. And actually, completely... <laughs> He texted me recently because he was having a moaner because I dared to critique their organisation. But this is, in a nutshell, where I see things. So they broadly claim, although they have to be slightly subtle about things. Morning, Cameron. I'll just change your role to an attendee. Uh, yeah, so... They broadly claim that the reason they're going through this process is because the German labor laws make it very difficult to restructure, particularly around headcount, uh, because of the way that their nationals are protected. Now, I'm sure that's part of the reason. I'm sure that's you know either a consequence or, or a major uh, driver of the process they're going through. But I have to say, given it's now December 2020, I'm not entirely sure that the things that are obvious now were not obvious, you know, a long time ago. The UK CEO is now the German CEO, CEO and that happened broadly at the, uh, pretty much a year ago, actually. And I understand that at that time, i.e. the end of 2019, there was fresh investment into the company because even at the end of 2019, there was some element of financial imperilment to the point that the UK operation didn't close in the sense that the UK operation still exists, but they had a big... Uh, headquarters, building, hangar, sales facility, offices at an airfield in the Midlands called Hapney Green, uh, which they had only recently and within two or three years occupied. They closed that, got rid of all the staff apart from an office admin girl who deals mainly in dealing with spare part orders to the various um, engineers that are around the country that service these aircraft, you know, third party engineers, uh, and went back to an office that's basically based out of Jerry Speech's uh, home in, in, in Shropshire. Now, the issue for me in terms of the way that they've managed this business generally is that obviously Jerry is based in the UK. So traveling to Hildesheim in Germany is not the work of five minutes. On the webinar, that their own webinar, their German uh, counterpart is living three hours away from the factory. And that's just no way to run, that is no way to run a, a manufacturing business at all, in, in my opinion. They've got that girl who is the co-CEO with Jerry Spage, who, apparently is part or knows the, the, the fresh investment side and has worked with that uh, entity before. And so I guess she's the eyes and ears for the investment, but what she knows about gyroplanes and manufacturing, I don't know. She, she may know a great deal, but tends to suggest, unless this company has been involved in aviation before, she probably doesn't know a great deal and she certainly won't know the history. 
in the UK, and, and I, I can speak reasonably confidently about the UK, and, and I do so because clearly the UK CEO is going to have an element of influence. The UK operation for Autogyro has been run, well, it's to the point that it, you could say, and I think there would be some consistency of view if you ask people in the UK, it's been neglected by Autogyro. The customer service is frankly hopeless. The servicing side was effectively offloaded to contractors that were working within the main facility, but they weren't, you know, employees, so to speak. And the, the products have got too expensive. Uh, old sport in the UK up until 20, until 2017, basically, the old one used to sell around 50 something grand sterling for a decent spec. And now they want mid seventies. I think they've just got rid of, they got three, they had three demonstrators of the 2017 sport that they themselves had, had purchased. The idea was they were going to try and sell them to the UK instructor base, but it was, but that was, that rollout was handled terribly I, I, to the point where, I mean, I was an instructor, an active instructor at the time in the UK uh, before I went to Qatar to do some work. And they just didn't communicate. You know, you were there asking for information. When can I get it? When's it available? And it was just nothing back. And I've just highlighted there that I think from information I can see from the UK Aviation Register, the last time they registered a sport was in February 2020. The last time they registered a Cavalon was November 19, and the last time a Calidus, January 19. Now, with those volumes, this business isn't going to survive. They suggest they've got huge volumes in China, but we all know that the Chinese are, I mean, these things are not exactly uh, difficult to copy. You know, the, the frame is essentially a steel box section welded together. Uh, with a Rotax motor and, you know, anybody can buy a Rotax motor and ancillaries and a set of rotors. Now, maybe the rotors might be proprietary to Autogyro, but there's plenty of third party uh, rotor manufacturers uh, that, that could do the job as well, I'm sure. So I don't think it looks particularly great. The big problem for if you're in the market for one of these things right now is the fact that inevitably, you asked for a huge deposit up front in order to secure an order. And who's going to do that? You know, you can't in all good conscience recommend to anybody that they sink their money into a company that's in this situation until the, the, the future is very much more clear than what it is now. And I think Autogyro could help themselves by being a lot more open with what their plan is for the future across different territories. In the US, my own opinion, and I know a little bit about the US market for Autogyro because would you believe, I think two, no, three years ago, almost, no, two years ago, uh, I had one of the instructors from Cloud9 that was then uh, a dealer on the East Coast in Florida uh, come to do his training with me because part of the US element was that they wanted to do that their instructors were going to do the 40 hour fly off process on the aircraft and he was telling me that that organization was a shambles in the end that all fell out of bed with Autogyro USA uh, you, you, Chris Lord was involved there he's now dead killed in in one of the aircraft and I've got to say when I see some of the people that are involved with Autogyro in the US, not only are they very inexperienced aviation wise, they're just very inexperienced gyroplane wise. You know, I listen to some of their instructors and it's, you know, it's just almost as if they've just literally fallen out of an instructor training course. And it's no surprise that when you see particularly Cavalon in the US, fall out of the sky and people get hurt or get wrecked on the runway. It's just, 
it's terrible. Uh, you know, it's not being managed properly, in my opinion, uh, and I don't particularly see a great future. I hope to be proved wrong because you can see for yourself with my aircraft model reviews, I'm actually quite positive on the dynamics of the aircraft. In fact, so positive that many you'll see in the comments actually, because I never delete anybody's comments from any of the videos. Some people think that I've got some commercial relationship with Autogyro, and I think you you may agree that the last ten minutes of talking about them suggests that I definitely don't. So there you go. Okay, any questions on that before I move on to more doom and gloom, basically? Nothing? Okay, we can, if, if anything springs to mind, then of course, uh, do, do let me know later. Okay, where are we now? So, I don't know what's gone on over the last uh, few weeks. But it seems to me that since the beginning of November, excuse me, there's been an enormous amount. Now, in fairness, this is global uh, numbers, but there's been a heck of a lot of fatal uh, accidents, actually. And we're going to cover a few of them uh, that, that fall into that category. Obviously, they're all very new, so some of the detail for a lot of them is not there. And then there's an accident, this Czech Cavalon accident, I just some of you already aware because we covered it in the last webinar. Uh, but for those who didn't see it, we'll cover it again. But look, the common theme, and there is a common theme, common theme with all of these are either their low time qualified pilots or their student pilots. And the concern for me is that either they're not getting the proper guidance from their instructor base, their instructor is not controlling the student very well, or for the qualified pilots, um, they're just forgetting the fundamentals. So the Cavalong that crashed in Scotland, he was an old guy. I think uh, he was 67. I've no idea whether that was causal or, you know, contributory to the accident. I understand from newspaper reports, actually, and from conversations with people within the UK, this was actually his second solo flight. And conversations with Auto Gyro, I've spoken to Jerry Spech about this, and he, at this early stage, there's nothing to suggest that there was any particular issue with the Cavalon. And on the basis there's been no airworthiness directive, uh, normally in these situations, if the AAIB, the investigating authority, if they find any particular issues with the aircraft, they normally issue an emergency airworthiness directive in order to remedy or control uh, the problem and they've not done that so far so my assumption is that there is no problem with Cavalon or if it is it's so subtle that they've not found it however I would say this I know the instructor that is involved with this is a super nice guy I mean really is a super nice guy actually um, and he will have been doing everything by the book. He's a follower of the Phil Harwood. In fact, he's, it's almost fair to say that he is like as much of a disciple of Phil Harwood as it's possible to be. When he started his flying school, for example, he, he bought himself a Mercedes kind of Vito, you know, minivan type thing. Which, is, which was exactly the same as Harwood's. So um, he will have done everything correctly. Now, you, you know, people who watch this channel and attend these webinars know that I'm not necessarily the uh, biggest follower of that ethos, but I can tell you that in fairness to all concerned, they're not cavalier. And if you follow that methodology, 
you'd be you'd be safe enough. Um, so goodness knows what's happened. Possibly medical, no idea, uh, or some other in-flight problem. But it was, you know, it was an in-flight issue that either the aircraft had, you know, maybe engine-related. That it's not so easy to spot after the fact. But it was definitely not at the usual takeoff landing type uh, scenario. So we'll watch that progression with interest because um, it is clearly something that niggles on people's minds as it would do. But, uh, you know, when it's a second solo and it's a 67 year old uh, student pilot, unfortunately you can, you know, if you can think about some scenario, then probably, you know, it could happen. Okay. The next one is this Cavalon that crashed in Czechoslovakia. Uh, there's the aftermath of it. One thing that's quite interesting about this Cavalon is that, <laughs> and I, I can laugh because in the context of everything else that's happened, it was a good outcome because even though the aircraft is completely smashed to bits, the student pilot, as it was, uh, walked away. I and I would draw your attention in actual fact, to the fact that, despite the fact that this aircraft, and we'll see a film of the accident in a minute, despite the fact that this aircraft has been rattled through this Armco barrier, it's come out of it fairly unscathed actually. And this monocoque structure that is a feature of Cavalon has stood up to the impact very well. So let me, let me get this video up and I will one second here. Let me just get this, let me just get this video up and then I'll show it to you all. I'll stop sharing and share another screen. I can see I've got a, uh, let me just see what the key, what the chat is, what someone's in the chat. <laughs> Bob's telling me that he's basically, he's 68. Now you're saying 67 is not too old. No, <laughs> no, it isn't too old, uh, Bob. It's just that clearly some people have had a, a bigger paper round, let's say, than others. Right, so this is the Czech accident. I'm pretty sure if I do this, there you go. I'm pretty sure you'll see this in big screen. Right, so here we go. So. The, the gyroplane currently is here. If you can see my mouse, it's going to arrive here and it's going to come from left to right across the road. So here we go. Boom. It has a proper impact. I mean, it's basically what happens is that the undercarriage, I'll just rewind and play again. The undercarriage catches that uh, barrier and just cartwheels it over. There you go. It's, it's probably why you do your safety belts up on uh, on a gyroplane. Although probably best just not to cartwheel through a barrier. But anyway, there you go. <clears throat> so that was that. Now, um, what happened there was basically very quickly. The student was at a point where he was doing his navigation exercises. They'd gone to that airfield, dual, with, so students and instructor. And then uh, they went back to the home airfield, having done this bit of nav together. And then the student was then going to do the route on his own. He explains that when he got to that airfield, he was tired. And he decided to have a bit more of a rest, maybe a bit of a snack before continuing. And when he continued, uh, that was the result. <clears throat> now, when you look at the airfield, there is a little snag. And it's quite an interesting one. And it's snagged, I've got to say, actually, it snagged me in some ways. Sometimes you go to parking and you're on the apron. And if you're at an airfield that's not particularly controlled, i.e., you know, you're left to your own devices, you start the engine, taxi to the hold, and then, you know, onto the active and liner. If you imagine 
you know, the runway's totality here, but the apron was kind of in the middle. And so what's happened is when he's when he's left the apron to the active, rather than backtracking and having the full width or full length rather of the runway available, he's basically just lined up from if ultimately the intersection. So it hasn't given him a great deal of room to the to the threshold, to the boundary. And I think what he's done is he's got to the point where he's realized that he's probably not going to get airborne by the time he gets to the to the end of the runway. And he tries to turn left to give himself a bit more space, hoping that he was going to get airborne, I'm sure. And as you can see, he doesn't. So lessons there, tiredness, probably should have just knocked it off after he'd done the duel and saved the solo for another day. But, uh, and then obviously not backtracking and not having an abort point in mind are all things to be thinking of. Okay, next is this MTO Sport in Kansas. I've no idea what happened there. Basically, it was pilot and passenger, another new gyroplane pilot, although he was a commercial fixed wing pilot, uh, killed himself and his passenger. Uh, they basically just found the burning wreckage uh, in a field. No idea what's gone on there. Could be, you know, wire strike, maybe, who knows. But, uh, and, I, and I've got to say, probably never really get a conclusive uh, view out of that one because I don't think there are any witnesses. And these sport type aviation accidents in the States are not, are not particularly investigated with any great uh, depth, to be fair. Uh, next is sport, MTO sport in Kenya. Uh, there's the, I don't know whether that was the accident pilot, certainly the accident aircraft. Uh, you can see a Western face in the background. I don't know where, I don't actually know whether this was taken in the US because these guys, according to Kenya Wildlife Service, middle of last year, came over to the US and did a little bit of training with these guys. I've got to say, I'm not entirely sure whether this was the totality, but there were seven pilots and they got, and they were over in the States for one month. And it doesn't seem an awful amount of time in aircraft, given the fact that seven people, even if you flat out, you maximum get one trip a day, probably, I mean, no, you're probably going to get one trip every two days, really, given that, you know, all the planning and stuff that goes on. So, I mean, I don't know whether that was a totality, but you can see that there's burnt out. Not much of that left, is there, really? It does look to me, though, given that, you know, the, the scatter of all the wreckage that it came down and, you know, with not very much forward airspeed, you know, and, and pack, looks like to me as if, the things just pancaked in, or I don't know whether that is a slope, you know, this looks like sloping ground, whether he's just tried to uh, do something and, and, and just, you know, it's just effectively a sea fit control flight into the terrain, but the thing's burnt out. And again, I'm not entirely sure who's the investigating authority in Kenya or, or how much interest they're going to have uh, on this one, but it was effectively a training flight, I'm, I'm told. Next one was an MTO sport in the Philippines. He basically hit the boundary fence on uh, takeoff and then ricocheted into a coconut tree. Uh, again, I'm not really familiar with the Filipino uh, ethos or philosophy to flight training or this guy's experience. But, and again, given the investigating authority, I'm not entirely sure we're gonna get chapter and verse on that. Uh, and then we come to the three most recent. And the first was uh, American Ranger 1 or AR1 in Florida. And I would say, again, that was another new pilot, 60 something hours, someone said. Um, and 
I've heard comments of three miles, three kilometers of visibility and fog. And it's hit trees, basically. I mean, that to me sounds weather related. It's very, it's very new, that accident. So I'm sure there's going to be, you know, more to be said about that one. But for me, when local weather, you know, aviation weather suggests that there was fog and so on, you know, that's weather related all day long to me. And, you know, just the basics being, being, uh, being dropped, to be honest. Uh, the next one, I'm going to cover the bottom one. They think it was a wire strike. Don't know what the aircraft was. That was in Namibia. Training flight two up with the instructor, I'm told, and hit wires. And there's a burning wreckage. Again, one hospitalized, one dead. It's quite depressing, really. I mean, I know I'm rattling on through this, but uh, I just don't know what, what people are doing. I, I, genuinely, I've got no idea what people are doing. It, it, it's, you know, if I wasn't so utterly exasperated, I'd be quite angry because, you know, more than anything, none of this really does anybody, you know, what isn't seen when it's all said and done is that I must have had, you know, a dozen emails saying, you know, look, I'm new to gyroplanes or I was starting training and I'm seeing this carnage, what's happening. And to be honest with you, at this stage, I don't know, but, you know, there's the aftermath. It's clear that it's happened. And, you know, when you've got student pilots or students with instructors ending up like this, what on earth is going on? Like literally, what I mean, okay, I know it's Namibia or the Philippines or Kenya or wherever, and we, you know, we, we in the West, you know, we're all, you know, when we're talking to Brits or to Americans or to Australians or New Zealands, we're all effectively from the same from the same mold. I mean, we're all effectively British at one point if we go back a couple of hundred years. But look, at the end of the day, you know, we do tend to think about these things a little bit more perhaps and we do have a lot more control but then you know we come back to things that guys in florida smashing themselves up in fog i mean come on there's enough information out there to avoid that kind of stuff and then the most depressing is this thing so and and i, and I know a lot more uh background to this because naturally I'm a point of people calling here. And I have to say, I can barely believe the, the, the story here. Now, you'll have seen a bit of a grainy, publicly available film on this, but I'm gonna show you a better film because I have a better film available to you. So I'm just gonna open it up, share the screen. I've got some questions. Let me just deal with some questions. Yeah, so Cameron's basically telling me uh, low hours on tight would indicate students let go before they're ready. Uh, is there a financial incentive to get the students? The, to, to be honest with you, there's not a financial incentive, Cameron, although, of course, inevitably, you know, one of the things that is clear about, well, probably GA training, it's probably not fair to just pigeonhole gyroplanes here, but you know, when you've got private pilots um, doing their, their, their private flying course, inevitably there's a relationship and it's, it's quite, a, you know, I can relate to my own students. You know, it's quite a, quite a friendly, you know, we're all geezers together. We all obviously have an interest in, in going flying and, um, and there's some kindred spirit about that. Um, but... And that does potentially lead people to be cajoled, maybe, or just to be too kind. I have to say, and I can only speak for myself, I don't know how others have, have, have addressed this, but when I was doing more instructing, uh, I've lost, I, I must have lost half a dozen students because I was just too harsh and not tolerating 
too much of a spoon-fed uh, mentality. You know, this, you know, if the one of the, one of the great dangers with students <clears throat> is that, of course, the early flights are effectively experienced flights. You know, they turn up and they just they're, they're wide-eyed and they're keen as mustard, and you know, literally just flying around the countryside. And 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 to be fair, you know, the UK is a beautiful country to to fly in. And, and to be a thousand feet over the green and pleasant lands of England blows people away. And it takes a few, you know, few hours of that before they kind of then start to think, you know, I need to pay attention because at some point, you know, I'm going to actually be doing this for myself. And that's where the switch needs to come. There's got to be an element where uh, the instructor isn't just the matey, corporate entertainer doing an experience ride anymore the instructor is someone that if that potentially and clearly in some cases has done and this has happened to me um you know you sent a student off to go and do some work and he, he just hasn't come back and you know that's a terrible terrible thing now we're going to talk about this thing about the AR1 in a minute. Bob's asking, he notes that Magni types don't feature as high as Autogyro. Um, it's not down to the training, Bob, I can tell you that. There's, there's guys that there's guys that are training on Autogyro or AR1 um, that are, you know, the competent people. I mean, I used to train on an Autogyro and, um, and I'd say that I was perfectly competent. Um, I think there's an element of magnet types not being as popular, if I'm truthful. You know, they don't sell as many. They certainly I mean, for example, M16, which is the common uh, tandem two seat trainer. I probably know of, uh, one, two, I could name six aircraft actually, M16. And I bet if you went on the CAA uh, G info, in fact, why don't we do it? We're going to do it now. We'll have a look. I'll, let's just, we'll abandon for now. Let me just go. So I'm just going to talk to the screen while I just go G info. G info. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, let me just share the screen with you. We've got another Q&A. What's happening? Nathan. Yeah, the video. Okay, Nathan. Yeah, this video from Utah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know what went wrong. and We'll, we'll cover that in a minute. Uh, Nathan, don't don't, and you don't need to worry. To be honest, you don't need to worry about the. You, you don't need to worry. We'll talk about it in a minute. Right, let me just share your screen. Actually, guys, sorry. Here we go. Boom. Okie dokie. So, if you're in another country, or if you're in the UK, actually, it doesn't really matter. The CAA, uh, that's the UK Aviation Authority. I've got this. Um, facility where you can look for aircraft. So if I put Magni in the aircraft type or name and press search, this will give me a list of all the Magnis. So you can see there's 55 entries. These are all the registrations. These are all the aircraft. And we've got three pages. Now, uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, we've got 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So there's 22 M16s in the UK. So if we go now and look for so I was a bit off with half a dozen, but I guess maybe some of those don't exist actually anymore. But if I put uh, auto, actually it's not called auto gyro, it's called rotorsport because of the UK importer. Now you can see you've got 161 entries. And if I look at, look, so the, the sport, for example, was MT03, before it then became sport. And look, there you go, you've got 20, I've got 25 on the first page, you don't have to count anymore. And, you know, and so it goes on. 
uh, there's a, there's just a huge a huge variation in terms of volume of autogyro to magni, uh, and that's because uh, magni basically is a is a family business. They make you know they're flat out all the time, and they are not uh, basically going to um, what's the word I'm looking for. They're not going to make any more, so they're not going to basically expand their capacity any more to to try and meet any kind of demand. They make what they make. They're happy selling that that amount, and 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 they're done. Right, back to this AR1 in Utah. So American Ranger One, for those who don't know, is basically looks like a an auto gyro sport, and I, I don't want to offend. American Ranger or Silverlight because I'm sure they see it differently. But I mean, optically, it looks similar. And of course, some of them have got a bolt on canopy, which then makes it enclosed. And this was an American Ranger one with a bolt on canopy and a Rotax 915. Now I'm going to play this now just, just to say you don't see anything gory in this, you don't see death and gore, but clearly this thing's going to end up in the ground. So if you don't really want to see that kind of thing, go make yourself a cup of tea. Uh, for the rest of us, we're going to watch it and we'll watch it a couple of times in full speed and then I'll point out some, some things. Yeah, it's probably enough, isn't it, really? So, uh, just before we watch the next one, we'll just rerun it just so you get the flavour. I mean, it's probably the wrong word to use, but you see my point. Now, uh, this thing was going to basically end up in the ground from basically 30 odd, 35, 36 seconds in, into this flight. The, the, the rest was effectively out of control. And I have to say that much of this was out of control, actually. Personally, th this guy needed just to have a cup of tea and a reflection on his life, but he didn't. This is the first solo in this aircraft. The problem for the instructor is he was a qualified gyroplane pilot and therefore, because of the way that the US regulations are, there's no requirement for him to have any differences training whatsoever. So he could buy this aircraft, jump in it and have a go with no no, no, no training whatsoever. So in a way, the instructor is kind of a little bit hand-tied, but I know that the instructor was not happy with this guy flying his aircraft. The controls I'm told of an AR1, and I've not flown one, <clears throat> but I've spoken to the owner of the company, they're actually quite light. Certainly, and this pilot, had got about 100 hours of experience with a Cavalon, where the controls uh, are not light. And what was the instructor's feedback was, is that this guy was basically constantly over controlling. And interestingly, I was first made aware of this because the son of the pilot, who's sadly now deceased, contacted me, suggesting that the takeoff technique that I suggest is, a, is a, a way forward, and we'll come on to that a little bit later, had caused his death because he suggested that 
the pilot had damaged the tail plane during the takeoff roll. That doesn't happen. But when we see this again, if you note, there's quite a lot of pilot induced oscillation during the early part of the uh, climb out. And bear in mind, this is with a Rotax 915. The motor, although this then gets slowed down so the engine noise um, isn't faithful to what we see when you play the video in full speed, as you would see on the channel. There's no attempt to close the throttle, which would be a standard uh, recovery maneuver. And of course, because the 915 generates a lot of thrust, what happens is at some point, I think the rotor's actually struck the tail before there's quite an aggressive uh, nose up attitude. But because of the thrust from a 915 and the fact that it's still running flat out, that prop thrust also contributes to unloading the rotor. So effectively, this accident is pure initially pilot induced oscillation. Then the fact that we don't address that as a pilot and we keep the throttle effectively firewalled, you know, it's flat out, that unloads the rotor. And then we end up in a load, you know, the typical old school low G rotor RPM decays, loss of control. Uh, and if we watch that again, you'll see takeoff actually he unsticks pretty cleanly. I mean, there's a bit of fidgeting actually, I suppose, but okay, first solo, and he's not the most experienced guy anyway. But there you go, a bit of roll, which is normal. But that one sticks relatively cleanly. There's nothing dangerous. This sticks okay. Then we get this, you know, flattening, over controlling. And then here, it just goes quite steeply nose high and there's a yaw input and a roll. And to be honest, he's lost, look, he's going to have lost the horizon at this point. And of course, because of that aggressive nature, you know, if we just go back to this point here, because of the steepness, that's not so steep, but now that's, that's very steep. And of course, it's difficult to keep the rotor loaded at that point without trying to, well, effectively loop the, loop the aircraft. And there's been a tail strike by that. And I think, to be honest, you know, 40 seconds into that, he is done for. So I don't want to over-egg this, but you can see you know, there's probably two seconds this video before the thing starts rolling. So, you know, 35, 36 seconds from brake release on his first solo, this guy's dead. And I want you to, if you are a student and you're watching this and your instructor is not happy with you going flying and stay on the ground, have a cup of tea, Think about it. Think about the fact that the instructor has got your best interests at heart because you don't want this to be you. Because at this point, pretty much now, that guy is just going to be terrified. Absolutely terrified. And now he's a passenger. There's nothing that, there's nothing he's doing now that's going to bring that back to, to the ground uh, safely. So there you go. I have to say, given the fact that there was, uh, that's right, yeah, well, so yeah, so Nathan, it wasn't um, his first solo in a gyroplane at all, it was the first solo in that aircraft, so basically I'm told the plan had been that he was going to potentially have a couple of weeks to learn to fly this thing, and he couldn't find time uh, to, to really commit to whatever he was going to commit to or thought, or, or I don't know, you know, people had, had some initial view of what he was going to commit to in terms of training. And I think he'd done a couple of hours dual. The instructor wasn't happy. In fact, I'm told he got taken aside 
into a hangar and had a bit of a, you know, explain the facts of life. And there you go. Terrible, terrible waste. And, you know, more so because the guy apparently, you know, look, he, he'd done 100 hours in a Cavalon. So, I mean, look, 100 hours is nothing really. But, but he, he, he must surely have been aware. I would say apparently he was trained by the auto gyro guy uh, around the West Coast. So I don't know whether that is a good thing, a bad thing, but for me, uh, look, forget the, forget the mistake he's made in this new aircraft. You know, at no point does he make any attempt to close the throttle, you know, and, and you can watch my own channel and see unusual attitude training. And anybody that flies in the UK will know that the unusual attitudes is a, a reasonably uh, specific element of the flying training course. And it's definitely something prior to going solo. But of course, as I already said, this guy had already got a license. So there wasn't really anything in the regulation that pro prohibited him from doing what he'd done other than sense, you know, good sense. And what, what he's done there is, is just insanity, absolute insanity. And, you know, incredible, you know, look, the one thing you, you, we might all reflect on is that if it hadn't been for the fact that somebody was recording that, and I guess because it was the first solo or the first time on his own in that aircraft, that was probably the only reason it was getting filmed. Because let's be honest, it's not like filming a Typhoon jet taking off. It's fairly, you know, it's fairly benign, really, in, or we'd hope it would be benign. But they filmed it, and thankfully we've got that. Otherwise, you know, once again, we'd be here going, oh, I wonder why that's ended up as a smoking hole in the ground. Oh, you know. And, of course, everything that, um, uh, you know, that could happen, we, we, we would be imagining had happened. But now we know for certain that it was just too keen and eager. Right. Uh, to Nathan's point, how can you stay safe? Well, the good thing is, is there's quite a lot you can do for yourself to keep yourself away from that problem. Clearly, differences training is one of them. And differences training, I'll just touch, as you remember here, I've got a specific thing. Now for some of us, so if you're a guy with me on the webinar from the UK, you will not be able to have done that because you'll be prohibited from uh, doing so by the regulation. But if you're in a territory where you can just jump in and have a go, then differences training might well save your life. But all that aside, what happens if you're in a situation and you get yourself into a sticky situation? What should you do? Well, the first thing to think about is what's likely. And I say TEM, which is a modern word called, or a modern acronym for threat and error management. The old fashioned view would be airmanship. So what kind of things are likely? And therefore, if we've identified the kind of things that can happen, we can then plan for them. And therefore we can manage our outcome a little bit better than some of the things that have happened over the last six weeks. So what is likely? Well, on the basis that pretty much 90% of modern gyroplanes are powered by Rotax 9 series, so 912, 914, 915, they're pretty reliable motors. So you don't tend to get very many stoppages of Rotax 9 series motors if they've been serviced properly and if you follow the procedures in the POH around, you know, checks and, you know, the check A or the, uh, the daily check and the daily inspection. So there's oil and water in there and you put the right fuel. They tend to be as good as gold. I've been instructing, I've got nearly 2,000 hours on gyroplane, mostly instructing, and I've never 
touch wood, I never had a problem. So I mentioned earlier, or just a moment ago, the daily check. Clearly, most gyroplane pilot operating handbooks have got a very big section on what the things you should be checking every day to make sure the thing's not going to fall apart. And if you do that check properly, then nothing should fall apart. And as we can see from our American Ranger 1, for example, it's not an aircraft problem. Very rarely are these things aircraft problems. So if you maintain your aircraft and if you do your daily checks and if you put the right ingredients into the fuel tank and into the oil tank, not a lot's going to go wrong from the aircraft perspective. So now you've got to think about yourself. And many of you, if you've been on previous webinars, will remember the currency barometer. Now, the currency barometer is robbed from the British Gliding Association. And the idea is that you look at the hours you've flown in a six month period, and then you look at the takeoffs and landings and you draw a line from one side of the, from the road, if you want to call it that, to the other. And where it crosses the, the middle part is whether you're red, amber or green. So for example, if you've done 15 takeoffs and landings in the last six months, but you've only flown for three hours, maybe you were in the circuit, so you did a lot of takeoffs and landings, you are rusty and that you should think about flying with an instructor before you go and do anything more. On the other hand, if you're in the amber band, you probably need to, you know, really overthink, if you like, the kind of things that you're going to need to conduct a safe flight whilst at the green end the key to that is not to, is, to, is a caution really about overconfidence and a casual attitude so that's a very basic um, overview of that if you want to get one for yourself if you go to the British Gliding Association website and search for currency barometer you will get, I'm just going to scroll because I've got, you'll get that basically. That's what you'll see. It's just the same thing uh, at a different slightly orientation and so on. But that's basically what you're going to get. And I would suggest that you all get one because it's not a bad, not a bad thing just to keep yourself nice and safe. The next thing is, in terms of threat and error management are things that are outside the normal POH or the normal routine of maintenance, things that you're doing that may lead to a problem. So for example, this is a picture of a glider and they need a tailwheel in order to move them. So it's just fixing that onto the tailplane of his glider and as you can see one of the potential errors is that he doesn't take it off before he goes flying so how can he manage that problem well he can paint it a nice bright color he can have some kind of internal pre-flight checklist that suggests have you removed the the dolly or he can just be disciplined to not get distracted and when he's you know, doing his attachment and movement of the aircraft and then real, you know, unattachment of that particular dolly. One of the things that glider pilots do, because it's quite a social activity, some of them wear a fluorescent hat when they're doing their daily checks and the rest of the group know that if you've got a fluorescent hat on, you don't engage in small talk conversation with them because they don't want to be distracted. Um, because of course, a lot of gliders are kept in uh, trailers. And so their wings and tailplanes and so on are all attached 
on the day they go flying. So there's quite a lot of rigging to be done and they don't want that distraction while that process is, 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 is ongoing because clearly it's got a big influence on, on flight safety. How could we relate that to gyroplane? Well, things like, you know, you check the oil and you unscrew the oil cap off the, off the, off the header. You know, do you leave that oil cap on the passenger seat and then go flying with the with the top off the oil off the oil tank, or do you put it in the footwell or on your seat so that it's impossible or more difficult for you to get in the aircraft without thinking, "Hang on a minute, what's that oil cap doing?" Ah, I must put the oil cap back on the on the oil tank, and 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 so on. Things, particularly this time of year, uh, one thing that auto gyro pilots will be definitely familiar with is the fact that when it's winter time they take an age to get any temperature into the motor so some people then start blanking with you know the broad two and a quarter inch tape blank off uh, oil coolers and uh, and radi water radiators of course then maybe they go flying two up and now the thing's overheating or they leave that tape on forever and then it becomes the summer and now it starts to go overheating again you know a little note in your in your in your logbook or something to remind you to to be checking these items is no bad thing so the next thing is around fear and the management of fear so one way that you can overcome the instant fear is just focus on the breathing or alternatively have a few key words that you can say to yourself that keep you focused and distracted from the fear but the best way to deal and manage fear is to pre-brief it's actually called an eventualities brief to ensure that for example you may think maybe I'm going to have a, an engine failure on takeoff. So what you do is before the flight, you are running through what you're going to do exactly if that happens. So for me, for example, when I fly from my local airfield, I've already wrecked the fields that are around the airfield. And I know that if there was a, an engine failure, for example, or any kind of problem, you know, like that guy that we saw in the American Ranger One, you know, he had some problem in the climb out. He could have easily initially just closed the throttle and chose to land ahead. Obviously, you know, you've got to imagine that when you're only a couple of 300 feet in the air, if you do close the throttle to idle, it's likely to end up on the ground in some form. But if you end up on the ground in a controlled, safe manner, that's way better than just crashing out of control um, to your death. Because, you know, falling from 300 feet, that's the most likely outcome. So the idea is that you pre-brief yourself what's, what you're going to do in the event of the engine failing or in the event of the oil light illuminating there's been a an accident in the states through an m16 actually where again it was a student pilot the oil light illuminated downwind and he continued to fly the rest of the circuit made a final approach and was going to continue and do another circuit and then the engine actually physically you know it sounded horrible so he decided he was going to land ahead but clearly there'd be no dialogue either between student and instructor or instructor's student around, if this happens, this is what you're going to do. And if you manage that process early, in the event that it happens, the fear probably will come later after you've realized the enormity of the situation. But in the moment, you'll just default into executing the plan that you've made for yourself and 
you'll more than likely walk away. I'll show you um, something in a, in, a, in a minute of, of exactly that. The other thing is review your flights. So for example, I, a lot of this is being robbed. You can tell from somebody who does a lot of gliding because gliders feature in the, in the slides. But look, the key thing is after you've done every flight, you should be making little notes in your logbook, in your pilot logbook, or a book that you keep with your pilot logbook that runs through all of the things that you could have done better. Now, it might be the fact that, you know, you've turned up at the airfield and it's 10 knots of wind, but it's 10 knots of wind across, you know, across the runway, and you've not really done that before. Now, maybe you think because it's 10 knots, that's kind of within your limits, but you need to probably have defined your own limits before you just take a punt. And, or you've arrived back at the airfield and so now you're in the air um, and you've got a crosswind. Well, you can't stay airborne forever, so you're gonna have to land. And maybe you dealt with it fine. So make a note, 10 knot crosswind, that was fine, and then update your own personal limitations. On the other hand, <coughs> you know, you may have gone flying and thought, mm, you know what? Actually, the radio didn't work very well. Obviously, make a note and get that fixed because at some point that could be the thing that next creates a snag. Or maybe the, I don't know, the, the, the airspeed indicator was a bit intermittent. I know on some of the modern, uh, you know, 2017 sport, for example, they've got these electronic airspeed indicators and altimeters, and sometimes they just freeze. Uh, you know, it's not so bad if you're an experienced pilot because you just look out the window and, and you know and just deal with it. But if you're if you're new, that could really uh, give you a, a proper scare. So again, review the things, make notes, and be keen to to get on top of whatever the issues were. And, and if necessary, seek the advice of an instructor and, and and either talk it through with them at the very least, or better still go flying with them and then have them critique you uh, honestly. There's no shame in, in, in self-improvement and not being always as good as you could be. I mean, for example, I've recently did a revalidation flight. Every two years you have to do a revalidation flight with an instructor in the UK. And I did mine the other, the other week. And I have to say there were elements of the flight which I wasn't particularly happy with. I mean. We got a little bit slow in the climb out, for example, at one point. Um, you know, I was slightly distracted. And I just wasn't on, as on top of things that could have been, mainly because we haven't been doing as much flying in 2020 as we, um, as we have done in, in prior years. So, uh, as I say, a, a, you know, a, a, a well-planned flight typically leads to a well-executed flight. Whereas a poorly planned flight uh, often leads to something that's, you know, less than well executed. And I'm going to show you something here, which is possibly a little bit over the top. So this document here is what they call an outbrief. This is really a military term. Uh, for General Aviation Safety Council of Ireland, this is actually something that an ex-Harrier pilot has put together. Now, that's quite a detailed uh, list, actually, and I can be sure that not everybody going flying in a GA context is doing this, but you might want to think about these things a bit more, actually. So, look, is the flight fully briefed and the aims understood? So basically, and whether that, when they say briefed, that might be briefed to the passenger or it might be a self brief. So do you understand what you're trying to achieve here? So I am gonna fly from airport A to airport B and I want to go via landmark C. If you execute the plan, for example, you're probably not going to run into airspace that you didn't want to run into. 
you're probably not going to run into weather that you didn't want to and you're going to have enough fuel to complete the task if you start wandering aimlessly around the sky that's probably not going to ultimately lead to doom and gloom all the time but it might do on the odd occasion that said if the idea of the flight is to wander around the sky for an hour because you know you've got nothing better to do and let's be honest on a nice summer day that can be perfectly acceptable but you do have to understand the block of airspace that you're going to be operating in so that you can make sure that the weather's good there's no threats from other airfields or other airspace users and that you've got the right radio frequencies to talk to the right people for example. So the next thing is, are our licenses and medicals all valid? Am I in current flying practice? Well, that's a, you know, a nod to the currency chart that we've done. The weather, is that suitable? Is the aircraft suitable? Are there any, any snags? So, you know, I've mentioned earlier, didn't I? Maybe you went flying and the radio wasn't working very well. Well, if you keep that going for a long time, that's definitely going to snag you. Next thing about fuel, have you got the right type of fuel? Well, we'll cover that later. And have you got enough fuel? And that's including the divert fuel. I mean, how many people, private aviators, even plan a divert? Many just don't. They'll, you know, they, especially nowadays when we operate off, off these things everywhere, we'll just type in our, our route, follow the magenta line. And if anything goes wrong, we kind of hope that we've got some spare capacity to, to, to get the diver. But of course, if we go back to, if we just go back to this thing here, let's look there. You know, we're going back to our well-planned, well-executed flight where we've done a pre-brief and we're trying to manage all the problems. You imagine if you've got, maybe the engine doesn't completely die. Maybe the engine's got a misfire and we're just slowly in a descent. Imagine in an open cockpit gyroplane, how easy is it to start fiddling with a map or replanning a route, then try and find the radio frequency? It's just not going to happen, especially, look, it might happen. For example, my own flying, you instruct within a local area of, you know, an hour, an hour and a half of a, of a particular base. You can fly around there with no maps, nothing, because you know where you are. It's, it's a piece of cake. But... You know, that's with nearly 2,000 hours. You've done 100 hours, you're just not going to, you're not going to know that. And then the weather gets a bit grotty, so you can't see, like the guy in Florida, for example, three kilometres or three miles of viz, that's not nice, actually. I've flown in similar, and it isn't nice even when you plan to fly in it. And now you're trying to re, and now you're trying to do all this planning on the hoof. It just doesn't, it does not work. Does not work. So, back to our... Back to our list, performance calculations. So that's all about how much runway do I need to get off? How much runway do I need to land? We've seen a few of gyroplanes in the boundary fence, haven't we? Maps charts, GPS up to date. Well, again, I saw, a, I've seen, a, we've probably all seen, if you haven't, you can go through my videos and you can see it for yourself. Do you remember the MTO Sport in Texas? His tablet froze. And he hadn't planned his route. He landed in a field to try and get it reset and then crashed into the trees trying to get out of the field that he'd landed in. It's just idiocy. Actually, he was lucky because he broke, I think either he broke his arm or he broke his wife's arm. Either way, she's never going to go flying with him again, is she? So that dream of flying around the country has gone for a burden. And it was some, it was a, such a, I mean, we don't necessarily get this so much in the UK. But of course, it was such a big piece of geography that he crashed in that it took ages and people just found him upside down in the trees, basically. I mean, it's unbelievable. So get the correct uh, up-to-date checklist for obvious reasons. No TAMs and local restrictions checked. Have you planned the flight? Have you got prior permission required? So i.e. have you phoned the airfield that you're going to to let them know that you're on the way? and so on and so forth. Now I can guarantee, <laughs> I can guarantee that you guys are not doing that for 
every flight. You're just not doing it. And if you're not doing it, I kind of get some bits that you may have been not doing, but when it all goes wrong and you've not got a plan, now you really are in a world of pain. So start planning. Obviously, if you're not flying very much, you know, some people are only flying 10, a dozen hours a year. It's easy to get rusty. So if you need checklists or eight memoirs to that kind of stuff, send me an email and I'll, I'll get a copy of whatever you need sent out to you. Right, now we're gonna move on quickly. This next bit is all about currency, age, medical performance. So I don't wanna make this an age thing. Bob's already pulled me up about the 67 year old quip. And of course, Look, I'm 49. I know I look a lot older, but I had a big paper round. I'm from the black country, which is a, a very deprived area of the United Kingdom. We're not all from California and sun kissed by the sun. But the truth is, there's no surprises there when older people are not as sharp as younger people. You can see in the background there, where there you go. I see it's all lighting up. Who's, Someone's giving me a bit of grief. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Bob. I look, <laughs> when I look 67, I know I'm in trouble. But in the background, you see that race car. And that's because that's what I used to do for a job. Uh, but I was a much younger man then. I was in my 20s and 30s when I used to do all of that nonsense. That's a picture. Of, uh, me at Le Mans, the, the 24 hour race. And I have to say, I don't think I could do it. Well, certainly couldn't do it to the same degree because it's actually quite good. But I don't even think I'm motivated to do it anymore. And that's part of getting old, actually. Now, I'm 49. I don't know what I'll feel like at 69. But the guy, for example, that crashed in Utah, he was 77. Now, listen, people might say, oh, yeah, but he was, a, you know, he was a sprightly, sprightly 77 year old. He was doing all kinds of good stuff, run marathons, yada, yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care. At the end of the day, he's not the same as he was when he was 27 or 37. And the other thing is, you have to remember that for most of us, we're not coming at piloting off the back of a professional career in piloting so it's not like we're ex-military so we've got you know four or five thousand hours in a fast jet or a helicopter or a transport where all of the conversations about check can you check the no tams or can you check the weather you know it's just routine and you know it because you've been doing it for your whole life if you suddenly come at this in your 70s for example all of this is new. And unless you treat it like a full-time job, which people don't because they've got other things, most probably a wife that wants to do other things, so they can't fully commit. And then that doesn't, I don't want to, you know, degrade the family unit, but what I'm saying is you're not thinking about motor racing 24 hours a day like I was when I was doing it. Same degree, some people are not thinking about flying 24 hours a day like people are when they're doing it as a career. So these things are going to trip you up more easily. The other thing to say is that some people think that because they've got a genuine pilot medical, and what I mean by that is some countries, so like the UK, for example, you can run what they call a self-declared medical. So basically, if you're if you don't have any known defects, you, you're good to go. You can fly these sport aircraft. Some people think that if you've got a more tailored pilot medical, that's going to identify problems. And one thing that it doesn't identify, for example, it doesn't identify heart problems. An ECG might give you an ECG to just see how the heart is performing, but it doesn't give you 
cholesterol levels, for example, or it doesn't show the degradation of the heart muscle, uh, of the heart, of the, you know, of the, of the arteries and so on. Um, so, for example, I had a student get killed. Uh, and when they did the autopsy, they found all kinds of uh, internal problems. And he was uh, with a UK class two medical. So it was the highest medical for a pilot outside of a professional airline pilot, which is a class one uh, medical. The other thing is, is you can identify if you're in danger by your age and lifestyle. And what I mean to say by that is, look, I'm 49. When I'm 69, I'm probably good for nothing because I've had a hard life. Other people like that guy in Utah, maybe he's 77, you know, he only eats beans and tuna and he's never going to have a, a medical problem. Who knows? What I'm saying is, if you eat fried breakfasts for 40 years and don't do an ounce of exercise, there is probably a better than even chance that you're going to be storing up some problems for yourself. So you've got to be a bit self-aware. The next thing I would suggest is you can tell if you're in more or less danger going flying by how you drive. And I don't mean to say <clears throat> whether you're a crazy guy or whether you're a bit more conservative, but what I mean to say is a self-analysis on your own driving to how it has been in the past. And people know whether they're, you know, for example, my dad, and I'm sure he won't mind, well, he probably won't see this because we're about an hour and a half in and he'll have abandoned long ago if ever he watches this. But look, my dad's in his mid eighties. He's a super nice guy and he is a man's man. He's a proper traditional man's man. You can see, I don't have any jewelry at all. That's because if I'd been a teenager, wearing jewellery with my dad, <laughs> no chance. So he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a tough guy, right? I mean, he's a super nice guy, but he's, he's a tough guy. So my dad, a proud man, I go driving with him and bearing in mind what I did for a living. We've driven all around Europe and some in the States together. He and his driving is degraded over the time that we've hung around together. Because you know when, the you, you know, I go and see my dad and I don't see him as often as, as, I, as obviously I used to, but, you know, he'll drive. He's got a Ford Focus and, and his state car, because he loves fishing. And every now and again, I go, oh, what's that, what's that graze on the side of the car or on the bumper? You know, it's just that little parking error that he's made, which, you know, 20 years ago, he'd never made that ever before. You know, in the past, if we ever drove anywhere, he wanted to drive. Now, he wants me to drive. You know, if ever we catch up together, you know, like I'll fly up to where they live and we'll get a coffee or a dinner or whatever, and he'll pick me up from the air, airfield. So he's driven to the airfield and then he'll give me the keys. Oh, you drive. You know, he's, so that's a signal. You know, my dad would never obviously take up flying because that's the kind of that's the kind of little signal that if you recognize that in yourself, just knock it on the head. Go flying with other people, or if you're gonna go flying because you're a current pilot, take a safety pilot. And if you're in doubt, the best way to know whether you're in danger or where you're at is just ask you firstly ask your wife, because she's never gonna be shy in telling you all your faults. <clears throat> and, if, and if you haven't got a wife, you know, ask your best mate. And, you know, and have that honest conversation about, look, I'm a little bit worried about these things. And I saw a program actually, and it was a, a super interesting program. And I know this is one thing I think as guys, we are not, um, you know, we're not very, we're not very good at, at talking about these things. But if you're, look, I don't know, um, 
I don't know people's personal circumstances, but if you ever want a good indicator on male behavior and whether this fits you or not, get this series, watch this series. You can watch it online. It's a great series for those who are not UK based. These two guys are comedians. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're two comedians. Um, they've been in a lot of TV series in the UK. And this isn't, um, this isn't a comedy program. It's a, it's a bit lighthearted. There's, some, there's obviously some humour in there. But it's quite a serious uh, human relationship journey, actually. And they talk about their vulnerabilities and their health issues as they, you know, as they get into their later life. And I, and I think... It's definitely something that, as pilots, we need that self-awareness. We, we, we need to understand ourselves and we need to be able to open up to people that are close to us on, on some of these issues. Because, you know, when you're in the air, even a couple of hundred feet, if it starts to go wrong, it, you know, the consequences are, well, there you go. I, that was that was pure chance me moving them moving them out, and and, and that's the consequence. Right, uh, couple of last points. Uh, this is Shogden. It's an airfield just to the north, I think, of Hereford, and uh, it was an AIB report, and it basically just proves that. This guy who la he had an engine failure off after takeoff, they actually think it was car icing and uh, lost power and he landed the aircraft in that field. And the pilot, when he was interviewed by the AIB, said, I'd already pre-briefed what I was going to do if I had an engine failure after takeoff and I just executed the plan. So if you read September 2020 AIB bulletin, uh, Bravo Tanga Alpha Lima and you'll be able to read his own words and finally some easy points to remember if you're ever in a situation and you haven't done all of those things you thought you know what this guy he's an old idiot he's got no idea what he's talking about but I did remember one one slide that he, that he mentioned this has got all the chances this is you are drinking in the last chance saloon here. This is what you should do. The first thing is you got to think about airspeed. And if you're in any doubt, because you've not read your pilot operating handbook, just fly 60. And that doesn't matter whether it's 60 knots or 60 miles an hour, 60 kilometers might be a bit slow for a gyroplane, but um, so that's a hundred Ks, but 60 miles an hour or 60 knots, that'll do. If you just fly 60, you're not going to plummet out of, the, out of the air unless there's some horrendous catastrophic failure. The next thing is if you trim the aircraft, it allows you to relax. And it's good that you relax because if you're tense, you tend to always introduce more backstick, which doesn't do anything for flying an accurate airspeed. So trim, fly 60. The next thing is that if you're at somewhere, now, of course, if you're over terrain, Two to 300 feet is going to be a visual thing because if you're flying on Q and H on the altimeter, which is a mean sea level, and you've got rising terrain and you haven't bothered with your chart, you probably don't necessarily know how two to 300 feet looks like. But once you're below two to 300 feet, look out of the window. There's no point looking at the instruments because by that point, you ain't really going to be able to fix things very well, especially if you've got yourself into this last chance saloon. So first thing is fly 60, trim and relax as much as you can. And remember, you're looking out of the window from two to 300 feet. The next thing is remember 60. So if you glance at the, at the altimeter and it's two to 300 feet, you need to have a last look at the, at the airspeed indicator. If it says 60, you're unlikely, if you've trimmed and relaxed, you're unlikely to decay that speed significantly to die in the last two or 300 feet. You may make 
a bit of a scruffy landing, but you're probably going to walk away, which is at this point all we care about. So, 560, trim and try and relax. Remember to look out the window from two to 300 feet and have a last glance at the airspeed indicator. And if it's at 60, great. If it's a little bit fast, don't worry about it. If it's a bit slow, well, if it's down to 40 miles an hour or 40 knots, try and lower the nose, but don't obsess. You still need to look out the window because the ground's gonna soon be upon us. And if you need something to really calm yourself down, talk to yourself. So vision, 60 and height. So I'm looking out of the window, I can see where I'm trying to get to. And if you can't remember the five S's, size, shape, surface, surround, slope, forget that, just look for the biggest field and aim for it, we'll deal with it later. At this point, if you're forgetting everything, you're in survival mode. And I suspect, for example, that Cavalon in Scotland. Now then, first solo. Some people that were eyewitnesses said the engine sounded funny. Now, of course, some of these people are not aviators. It doesn't necessarily mean a great deal. But you could have a problem on your first solo as, as much as having a problem on your 1,000th solo. And if it happens on your first solo, what are you going to do? Let's be honest with you. Are you going to pull off a textbook? If that's your first solo, is that likely? Well, hopefully, but chances are probably not because, you know, you've probably taken a second or two to realise you've got the problem because, you know, you, you, you were maxed out mentally as it was. So if this is you, just think, look, I'm going to fly 60. I'm going to try and relax and I'm going to fly 60. And then once I'm down at these kind of levels, two, 300 feet, I'm just looking out the window and making whatever landing you know by that point the insurance company owns the aircraft don't worry about saving the aircraft think about yourself listen when i was driving these things they were that car there was getting on for a million bucks worth and if that ended in the barrier it doesn't matter who cares you know someone someone was going to pay well i was getting paid by the team so it was never going to be me but the point is even if you owned it what are you going to do are you, going to, are you going to end up like this? Are you going to end up like this? Because you got slow and you were just trying to get to that nicer bit of landing space. Or are you going to end up like matey and sacrifice the aircraft and think, you know what? I'm down in a field. Happy days. Top man. So there you go. Right. Takeoffs. What are we trying to achieve? Well, the idea with takeoffs, and I and I, I know this sounds a little bit um, simplistic, but the everybody should be thinking takeoffs in the context of trying to clear fifty feet. So, typically, we have a ground roll. This would be either a wheel balancing phase or uh, you know, either you call it distinctively a wheel balancing phase or you've just, you know, ended up on the main gear for a short time before you're now in this airspeed build-up phase and then we climb away once we've got sufficient airspeed to, to climb away. So this whole distance where it says takeoff distance required, that distance required is to clear 50 feet. I know it sounds a bit simplistic, but not everybody thinks of it that way, and we'll come to that in a minute. So, takeoffs, what goes wrong? I'm going to rattle through these because we've got some material left to cover, but the things that go wrong in takeoff either over rotation, blade flap, climb out behind the drag curve, or in some people's language, climb out behind the power curve. They run out of runway. They don't deal with the crosswind very well. They lose your control. And that's usually correlated co to something else. So typically they get, they over rotate. So the aircraft's like this, 
and then they get some your event which finishes the whole thing off or they're very unlucky and they get an engine failure and of course if you get an engine failure well you're just unlucky or you're not unlucky because you didn't maintain your engine or you didn't put the right fuel in it and you get everything you deserve so to speak so over rotation auto gyro aircraft or things with a crank keel are more at risk so things like that american ranger would be uh predisposed to over rotation because they obviously the kinked tail allows that if i go back to just to show you what i mean this kink tail obviously allows a much higher nose attitude uh, during the t during the ground roll or trying to get to a wheel balance than a Magni M16, which has got straight uh, a completely straight uh, keel. So, if you over rotate, it's typically because you've tried or in your mind you're trying to get to a wheel balance you're not thinking necessarily as a takeoff as a takeoff you're thinking of the wheel balance and then wheel balance to take off and in trying to get the wheel balance the things ended up on the tail and if you look at for example the cavalon videos on my channel most of those are over rotated where they sit really on the on the tail then there's a whole bunch of drag that comes on because the angle of attack now is enormous and the thing sits back down and we end up in this, what I call Cavalon knob. So uh, that's poor technique basically, or, you know, a, a mindset thing. Um, the other thing that can happen is the, 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 the change in weight. Obviously when you're a student and you've been flying with an instructor, I'm 85 kilos in a flying suit and a helmet for a, an open aircraft. And you take me out of the aircraft and obviously that's 85 kilos gone, which is a considerable part percentage wise of the all up mass. If on the other hand, you fly with some other people that we could say, they're probably getting on for hundred plus kilos and that's an even bigger uh, change in weight and balance. And these things are obviously important to think about when you do a student solo uh, and it's no surprise that i think some of these issues that have been created in the accidents that we've just seen where they're early solos for students maybe weight and balance is part of the problem because the aircrafts feel very different once you get rid of you know a quarter potentially of the total all up mass so what's the consequence of over rotation? Well, basically, you unstick at a very low airspeed. Why do you unstick at a lower airspeed? Well, because you've got a lot bigger angle of attack. Um, and so therefore, the aircraft tries to get airborne at a lower speed, i.e. more angle of attack. Uh, you know, if you think of the lift equation, uh, angle of attack is, well, it's basically angle of attack and speed. So the more angle of attack, the more lift you get at a lower speed until the aircraft stalled, but that's a different thing. Uh, and also because these lower speeds unsticks happen without the aerodynamic tailplane working as effectively, you tend to get a bigger yaw reaction. Uh, and actually, if you watch that um, Utah American Ranger accident, you see that he starts to get some punch initially the nose is is raising quite high and when he unsticks initially he definitely gets a yaw and uh, and roll moment initially the other thing about being quite nose high is that you can't see quite so well so you start peering um, and also if you then continue that angle into the climb out potentially you're climbing out are much steeper than than you might want to and again loss of control is possible in all and of course i call it cavalon knot it's a very common thing in cavalons one of the problems of course is why you're sorting all this out if you think about our distance required to clear 50 feet in sorting out all these problems just eats 
uh, runway. So if we think back to our planning phase that we talked about early on, if you've planned to take off in 500 meters, for example, and during the course of the takeoff, we've spent 200 meters sorting out a problem. Well, now, if we thought we needed 500, now we need 700, and that might not be available to you at the airfield that you've flown to. Next thing is blade flap. Uh, what happens here? Well, basically, that's basically allowing the rotor RPM to decay. Uh, typically, it starts typically because someone's being distracted, the pilot's being distracted, and he's not monitoring the rotor RPM. And it is only recently on modern gyroplanes that, you know, a lot of the instructors have started to talk about rotor RPM. There's a great well, there is some conversation amongst, well, gyroplane pilots, whether, you know, there's an old school view that if everybody's taught to balance on the mains or wheel balance everywhere, then you don't need to look at rotor RPM. And in a way, that's true. But the problem is, if we then relate back to, to this, and this is material, i.e. this airfield does have trees at the end, and this distance is getting towards the limit of what is possible with our aircraft. If we are not accurate and we need some methodology to make us accurate and consistent, then in some ways, especially with heavier aircraft, it's not so much problems with single seaters because obviously that distance is so much shorter and at the end of the day, once you're down to sort of being able to do this in a couple of hundred meters, well, you know, it obviously becomes relatively academic because not, you know, you're not taking off from football pitches, are we? But, but once we're into distances that normally require four or 500 meters anyway, if you then start taking 700 meters, well, that can be a, a completely different airfield. And my issue in some ways with, well, we'll talk about it later, actually. But anyway, the issue with blade flap is fundamentally a failure to monitor rotor RPM. And when all of these factory aircraft have got rotor RPM gauges, there's no excuse not to monitor. So why have the rotor RPMs decayed? Well, firstly, it's either a big delay or very slow bringing the stick back after you've released the pre-rotator. Uh, and that's, you know, early pilot nerves and not really thinking about what they're doing accurately, so they're a bit hesitant. Um, or they're searching in the cockpit for the, the rotor RPM gauge. Again, it goes back to differences training. You look at, you know, where's the rotor RPM gauge on this one? Well, I can tell you it's there. But where's the rotor RPM gauge on this one? It's actually there, but, but, but being there isn't being there. And, and of course, if you fly that aircraft, I've got no idea where the rotor RPM gauge is in that. And of course, if you haven't done differences training, then neither will the pilot that hasn't done differences training until he's now floating down the runway and he's got absolutely no idea what his rotor RPM is, and then has a problem. So the other issue is people not bringing the stick back at all. That's typically because they've just forgotten. You know, they're just then mentally overloaded uh, or their process. And this is another thing that we'll come on to. Their process has become so complicated. I mean, I fly, I won't name him actually, because he's a, he's a super nice guy. But if anyone flies, if anyone's in this forum, and I know there are some people in this, in this uh, forum, that are flying the UK. If you're a student still, because I don't know whether you are students, but if you are, if you go to your airfield next and you see your instructor, and he's one of these instructors with literally, you know, a volume of, of things taped to the inside of the aircraft, you know, different checklists and so on. <laughs> Other word. You know, because these things are not actually that complicated. Look, there's a process, but for me, 
all of these things should be committed to, to the to the to the mind. Even <clears throat> and even if they're suggested that they're an aid memoir to the student, that's too much spoon feeding. The student needs to remember these things off by heart, and it's not a difficult thing to do. For example, I could tell you if you're an auto gyro, you'll line up on the runway, you'll have the brake in the hand, the choke will be off because you'd have done that way before. You'll set 2000 engine RPM, press the pre rotator with the stick uh, fully forward, and you'll watch the rotor taco. You don't need to be reading that off a checklist on the inside of the cockpit. And of course, what tends to happen is because people get comfortable writing these huge long lists, these lists then think, oh, you know what? Why don't we add to the list that we should check that the runway is clear before we get going? Or why don't we add to the list that we should really do another cross check or check that the passenger's okay, blah, blah, blah. And then before you know it, you, you know, you're onto page two of a long list. And all of a sudden, what you find is that you've been so concentrated, for example, on making sure that the passenger is all okay, that you've forgotten to bring the stick back and you've just destroyed the aircraft, you know, 200 meters after brake release because the blades are flat. So this is the problem. Um, the other issue is not seeing the rotoring RPM increase prior to relaxing any back stick. It's a typical something in Magnus where the stick forces are, are, are quite, some Magnus, I mean, M24, I hate flying actually. The, just, the, level, the stick force is just ridiculously high. It's unnecessarily high actually. And, um, you know, some of these guys are just, they just get weak in the arms because it's hard work holding the stick back. And bear in mind the Magni, you've held the stick all the way back um, for a while because part of the pre-rotation process has the stick all the way back. And they just release that back stick just for some physical relief. And, you know, if the rotor RPM isn't, isn't increasing at that point, then the rotor RPM can decay. The other issue, especially because we're getting older, uh, you get a physical limitation. You know, you're trying to get the stick all the way back, but your fat tummy's in the way and you just physically can't get it. Or you're in a tandem aircraft. This can happen. It happened to me, actually. Uh, thankfully, I caught it in time. But, you know, you're flying a tandem aircraft on your own, but you've got an overnight bag on the passenger seat all strapped in, and either it's slipped or you've got, you know, you just put too much stuff in. And that's the thing that is uh, restricting the back seat. The other thing, actually, is in a 2017 Sport, if the rear seat is not fully down, that can really uh, affect the, um, the stick movement. And I don't know whether this in the chat is going to say the same. Stick force and a Magni, I must have. Ha! Bob, I can tell. So, we, so, so I can tell that Bob is at least 69, sorry, 67, and flies a Magni. Yes. No, but the thing is, though, Bob, I, I don't, do you fly an M? Are you fly an M16 or an M24? I don't, I don't know, Bob. But the stick force is just off the chain. It, it is high. It's unnecessarily high, actually. Um, I mean, yeah, you can do it, but but also, um, again, going back to the age thing, you, you can't, you're kind of right, actually. You know, as you get a bit older, you, you you're naturally not as strong as you would be when you're a fit, healthy, forty-nine-year-old. Anyway, uh, another thing about why rotor RPM is okay, sometimes it can just be the fact that the wind's uh, a little bit light and, you know, you don't get the prevailing wind giving you that assistance. Um, you could have left the rotor brake on. Again, that's a bit of an issue with Magni uh, because the rotor brake isn't necessarily the most obvious. It's not the most powerful, actually. I've, I've left the rotor brake on with the Magni and uh, wondered what on earth that noise was and then carried on anyway. More for me. Uh, rotor inertia in a Magni, they've got big old heavy rotors. So what tends to happen is if the rotor RPM does start decaying with the Magni, it takes a lot longer to start to accelerate again. So for your Magni owners, and that's Bob, 
uh, then that is um, that can be a problem. <laughs> good banter, Bob. Good banter. So, what was the other problem with takeoffs? Running out of runway. Uh, that's basically poor planning. That is poor, poor, poor planning. For some of you, though, and I don't know whether anybody flies an ELA, some of the data in their pilot operating handbook is just junk. I mean, absolutely junk. Um, they, they need to do something about it because it tells them, tells you nothing, actually. Um, I haven't got time really now to go through the POH of, a, of an ELA, but if you, if you just go on the internet and Google ELA and find a model, you know, I think they do an S7 or something similar or a 7S uh, and, and look for POH, you'll find a PDF and look and try and work out how far or how quickly you could clear 50 feet. And I'm telling you, you'll, you'll not find the data. It's, it's ridiculous. So um, do be aware of those kind of snags. The other snag, we've mentioned the wheel balance error already, but the other one is not using 100% throttle. And I'm going to cover that um, now because it's a modern phenomenon and, a, well, it's ridiculous. So techniques. One of the issues, in my opinion, about, and this is, <sighs> this is where, in some ways, I start to diverge from the, the traditional, you know, gyrocopter experience, Phil Harwood, School of Thought. For me, one of the problems around some of this is that there is an inconsistency, not just in terms of narrative, but in terms of description. And some of the technique in what is basically one of the most fundamental phases of the flight, the takeoff, is evolving too much. So what do I mean? Well, look, this here on the left-hand side of the screen is actually an extract from uh, an AAIB accident report, but it describes, the, sorry, it describes the technique to take off from the 2008 book, how to fly a new generation gyrocopter. And it basically talks about pre-rotating, uh, build the rotor speed, do a wheel balance, and then lift off and fly along a few feet above the runway at 70 miles an hour, then climb out. And then it talks about a performance takeoff used to achieve the shortest possible ground run, which he describes as you'll become lower at a lower forward airspeed. Okay, so that is confused because the CAA published a safety sense leaflet around takeoffs and they describe a performance takeoff like this, i.e. to clear 50 feet while they class the other thing as a rough ground takeoff, which would be to use the new generation gyrocopter book of 2008 that would be called a performance takeoff. Like, but then we have even further confusion for those in the UK because this kind of rough ground takeoff is called an advanced takeoff. So you can see that you know you've just got snags and pitfalls to fall into left, right, and center. Today, and this is to my knowledge, at least what was being taught in the summer autumn of 2020, the best practice from the same bunch of people, they now talk about power to initial and then lift power. I can tell you, lift power is 100% throttle. It's never anything different. I had a conversation with the instructor that did my reval literally uh, last week about the same, about this very thing, because he follows this doctrine. And 
one of the things he was saying was, ah, it's the reason we use the word lift power is to help the students so that they don't always get into the air on full power and it makes it easier for them to get to a wheel balance with the initial power and it means that then it's not too aggressive when they finally climb out and i said to him well basically you're releasing to the world and giving a pilot's license to people that fundamentally can't take off to achieve to achieve this to achieve the best performance to clear 50 feet and and he didn't really have an answer, to be honest with you. And then, and then we wonder why people get to their chosen airfield, I mean, pass their pilot's license, and think, you know what, I'm going to easily be able to clear those trees because the PO8 says I can get this done in 500 metres. And you can't get it done in 500 metres because guess what? that number in the poh assumes that you're on full power and you've decided you're going to use this lift power it's just it's just basics so that's why a performance takeoff is always to clear 50 feet that's the number that you're going to get from the poh if you decide to do anything different woe be tied if that distance required is marginal at your chosen airfield because you might not make it. That's all I'm going to say. Right, landings. Another big danger area. The main difference between landing issues and takeoff issues. Takeoff issues usually come from poor planning or a mental capacity issue, whilst landing errors are usually skill related. There's not really very much to go wrong in terms of a planning or massive long checklist to think about for landing. Takeoffs, depending on how you've been taught, who you've been taught with, and what process you've been given to take off, that may not be the case. So landings will start off with a currency barometer, how safe you are, because one of the big snags is around weather. So typically crosswinds really do blow people's minds. They're not particularly difficult. If you want to see how it's done, I've got a, a very nice crosswind demonstration video with, with me flying actually um, in a crosswind. It wasn't a great crosswind actually, just because that was just the day that I had for filming. But anyway, um, the technique, there was a crosswind and uh, it's very straightforward. It's basically you approach final approach uh, balance, so the your string balance down the windscreen. And once you get below sort of, well, depends how confident you are to get into position, but certainly around 100 feet, the first thing you want to do is put the nose of the gyroplane on the center line with the pedals. So nose on the center line with the pedals, you're now going to start to be blown away from the center line with the wind. You stop that by a little interwind stick, and it really is with a gyroplane control authority, you know, the movement that you've got available in a wrist, and that will keep you stable straight down the runway. So you'll have no yaw and you'll have no drift. If in trying to get to that position, you've drifted away from the center line, don't try and reacquire the center line. Just if the center line is here and you've been blown with the wind over here, just parallel the center line and be comfortable there. Don't try and get back, otherwise you end up, you know, over controlling and missing it. But that is the crosswind thing. The currency barometer is important because, for example, Here's an accident, May 27th, 2020. That was a couple of days after the first lockdown ended in the UK. And lo and behold, matey here, whoever this guy was, another 67-year-old Bob, 
a uh, few hours looking in the last 90 days. I mean, he wasn't massively experienced anyway, but even less so because of the virus. And he smashed that aircraft up uh, in, a landing, in, a, in a landing accident. So what goes wrong? Well, I've got to say, outside of crosswinds, the biggest problem for people landing is that their approaches are very inconsistent. So what that means is um, you've got a circuit. Here's my, here's my runway. Sometimes I approach from 500 feet, sometimes I'm at 1,000 feet, sometimes I'm a bit lower, sometimes I'm out here, sometimes I'm near here. And you can never get a good visual on what is going to work out for you. So, for example, my view is if you go to a new airfield, and look, one of the problems actually is that, and I see it a lot actually in the UK. In fact, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I did a webinar. <laughs> well, Bob, you talk, okay, so Bob's, Bob, we're having some banter, Bob and I, because Bob's telling me that if he'd been in a Magni, he wouldn't have crashed on landing. Ah, now, so a couple of webinars ago, I talked about landings specifically. And I then had an email from someone that said, I'm really confused because you keep talking to, about the need uh, to trim on final approach. And I never trim on final approach because I've trimmed during the flight and I never need to retrim because I'm flying a Magni M16. I, I, I've trimmed for 60 and I never need to retrim for the landing. And it turned out that what was happening with this guy, he was basically doing the whole hour of his lesson flying around at 60. So he never ever changed speed they just flew everywhere at 60 so of course it didn't matter whether he was flying out over open countryside or on his final approach he just had trimmed and it stayed trimmed and that was that but of course that's just ridiculous because once he gets his license or hopefully i mean i i, I do hope that further on in his flying course he's going to be flying a bit more than 60 miles an hour and then obviously you'll need to trim so these things do it is amazing what what goes on and what people end up with as situations. A lot of people, for example, you'll see, you know, people talk about flying like a gyro pilot. It's what it's like one of my most hated phrases, flying like a gyro. I don't even I don't even know what it means, but typically, it's typically an instructor or a, you know an experienced gyroplane pilot that says this nonsense. And what they mean is you know, chop the power and do every landing as a glide approach. But the problem is, is all of this bottom end phase is all super rushed. And if you don't get it right, what tends to happen in these situations is that in trying to get the airspeed back, either you do it late and so it just ends up being quite a hard landing because you just haven't got the airspeed back, or you overdo the airspeed, you know, you've got too much airspeed, so then you start ballooning. And of course, when you've got, you, we've got to remember, students are not 2,000 hour uh, pilots. They're 20, 30, 40, 100 hour pilots. And they, they need to do simple things and take little bites of the cherry because that will allow them the best chance of success. So inconsistent approaches don't work. Slow or glide approaches tend to be more difficult because they lead to aggressive flares. People round out too high, that's another typical situation with glide approaches uh, because the ground rushes up and people try and pull away from it. Uh, big power change is late on. Again, you know, you can imagine if you're on a glide approach, suddenly you just put power on because you're just trying to cushion something in, a, in an auto gyro or magni definitely you'll get a yaw change and of course you know you can't touch down in with with any significant amount of yaw because the gyroplane will then roll over people get reluctant to go around you know they've committed to the landing and they're definitely going to land and then it's not working out for them and they try and force that to work that's co cost more than a few aircraft there um, their continued serviceability. 
people bashing the circuit when they're very new to the game, that's not good because it's massively mentally overwhelming. If you're doing more than, I would say more than four or five circuits, then stop because you just get tired. <clears throat> and if you've made mistakes during those four or five circuits, you also get frustrated. Crosswinds we've mentioned, yaw and drift we've mentioned, and there's a US thing about linked nose wheels. In Europe, we kind of, we don't have anything other than linked nose wheels, so it's not really an issue. Uh, to be truthful, it just plays to the yaw and drift element. You know, if you're a bit lazy and you land with yaw and drift, if you've got a, a casted nose wheel, you'll probably get away with it more than you will um, with a fixed uh, or a linked nose wheel. The thing is, bear in mind we always land on the main gear and probably hold the nose off. I don't, I, I can only speak personally, but my nose wheel very rarely touches the, the, the runway much above 10, 15 miles an hour. And by then it's a non-event because, you know, the, the rate of decay in speed from 10 to 15 miles an hour is, is pretty instant. Um, the side-by-side -side factor, that's interesting. In so far that, um, clearly, if you've learned to fly on a tandem trainer, and then go and buy a Cavalon, for example, the optics are gonna look very different. And we'll talk about some of that in differences training, which is our next topic. And of course, the other element of, of landing errors is, you know, you've got to remember, after you've landed, the rotors have still got a lot of energy. So realistically, stick forward and central and don't get distracted. If you look at my, again, another video I've done on the channel years ago, actually, you know, people getting distracted with putting rotor brake on early or stick retainers if you're in a Magni. Just don't do it. Just let the rotor energy decay uh, and don't deflect the stick because you, you will just roll the aircraft over. Okay, difference is training. So we've kind of talked a little bit or probably quite a lot about this already with the Utah uh, accident. And in the UK, it's less of an issue because regulation kind of protects you from yourself. And in, in a way, um, the more, I've got to be honest, the more I see of other country accidents, the less I get frustrated with the UK regulation because I think by and large, the UK regulation probably strikes the right balance between freedom and, um, and, and, and constraint from the pilot licensing. I think we're probably too constrained on the aircraft uh, licensing, but pilot-wise, I, I, I think we're good, actually. And um, if anyone who's not from the UK that watches this wants a copy of a UK syllabus to try and run to, it might not be a bad thing. Anyway, chances are, if you're a pilot in training, you're probably not flying a German registered aircraft, but you're probably flying something like this, either an ELA, a Magni M16, or as this is, an MTO Sport. So normally, instructor aircraft are 912 powered because that's the, the most reliable of the Rotax engines. It's very cost effective. Um, it's got a good reliability, good fuel economy, and it's very robust. It's also not massively performing because it's got 100 horsepower. So when you send your student solo, is less likely to get distracted with the performance. So as you can imagine, if you've learned to fly in that configuration, pass your test and then go and buy one of these, it's not going to be the same. Neither is it going to be the same if you get a panel like this when you came from a panel like that, or you flew one of these and then flew one of these because that's an MTO Sport, which in that uh, era will definitely just have a uh, steam powered so a normal air driven asi airspeed indicator an altimeter with um, a tri 
you know, three engine instruments, so oil temperature, oil pressure, and water temperature on a gauge, on a regular normal analog gauge, whereas an M24 has got this, I hate them, they're called a Rotax Flydat, and there's a whole bunch of digital uh, values for engine RPM, oil pressure, fuel pressure, temperature, so on and so forth. So you need to know what you're flying just from a basic cockpit management and interpretation perspective. The other thing is if you fly an MTO Sport, you'll have these organ pedal arrangements. If you fly a Magni, you'll have a much more normal aviation uh, rudder pedal arrangement, as in it you know, pushes away like that. Little things, but again, maybe for most of you flying when nothing goes wrong, you don't care because you probably don't even look at the instruments. But at the time when pressure is upon you and you don't know what you're looking at, then you wish you'd probably spend a little bit more time really knowing where the switches and the gauges were that are going to look after you the best. The other thing to know is that if you're going to go and fly one of these, it's probably going to not feel anything like one of those, even though they look not a million miles dissimilar. And certainly in the UK, there's a little bit of nostalgia for the old Campbell cricket. I've had people, well, in fact, very recently, within, within the last month, I've had a person contact me to ask about flying a Campbell cricket that they'd found. And uh, I, I dissuaded them from, from doing so. They were an English uh, recently qualified pilot. They'd learnt on one of those and he was gonna buy one of these and I told him, do not do it. Um, I want, you know, and I said to him, I want you to be under no illusion. I'm not just, suggesting it would be okay in these circumstances. I said, in no circumstances, buy and fly this aircraft, because one of his problems was, his rationale was he was saying that, you know, he got 5,000 quid and he could buy this and do, you know, a, a half a dozen hours a year, blah, 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 and it was cheaper than flying the other one to rent. And I said to him, how many hours have you got? I think you've got around 50 hours. 60 hours uh, solo time. And I said, look, you know, you, you're just not experienced enough and you're not going to do enough flying after the fact because you don't have the resources to do enough flying. If you, you know, you're better off just spending what money you do have doing less flying in the aircraft that you learnt on than trying to relearn this new aircraft because they're, they're very much different. And likewise, RAF 2000s. One of the other problems when you start buying this kind of aircraft is that over the years, the specifications have evolved and it's very, it starts to get very difficult really understanding what you've bought. For example, this is a good uh, illustration. This is an RAF 2000. You can see it's a British registered RAF 2000. This is one of the I'm not sure what year this is, but you could probably surmise that it's relatively old because I don't think Allied Dunbar exists anymore. And obviously it's a B registered. So now, for example, in Britain, uh, we're on Charlie, Charlie Lima, I think, maybe even Charlie Kilo. Anyway, no, Charlie whatever, well, I think we're on Charlie Lima, but anyway, look at the tailplane here, and you'll see that we've got a vertical element to the tailplane, but no horizontal. This is a recent picture of another RAF 2000 that's, I think that picture was taken uh, last year. Now that aircraft is gonna be dynamically very much different to to that aircraft, there's no doubt about it. Now, I don't know 
what that difference would be because I'm not an experienced RAF 2000 pilot. But someone will probably know. But I guess as time goes on, if you end up buying this, for example, and start flying it around the sky, and you just haven't happened to plug into the right guy to tell you the dynamics of this aircraft, well, now you're kind of on a voyage of discovery uh, all of your own. So, moving on. Fuel, it matters. It's a little bit uh, obvious, and I just want to highlight to you my own film on um, MoGas. Now, I've had a little bit of pushback, actually. Someone sent me an email and then wrote in the chat that Rotax engines are built for MoGas. And that may well be the case. In fact, I think it is, it is the case. It is the case that Rotax engines are perfectly happy with MoGas. But the problem is, is that the fuel doesn't really care whether it's in a Rotax or a Ford Cortina or something else, a lawnmower. The chemical properties of no gas are going to be consistent, doesn't matter whether it's in an air, aircraft engine or the fuel that it was more commonly used in, in a car. And I want you to look at this video that I've done about MoGas in gyrocopters instead of 91UL or Avgas. Rotax motors don't like Avgas because they don't like the lead in the Avgas. It tends to coat particularly the valves and then the valves don't sink particularly well and you need more frequent maintenance on the motor. But the important thing about this is a bunch of links in here to the Light Aircraft Association. And I want you to see for yourselves, it's, it, it's a very, some of the documents are quite in depth um, and we don't really have time to talk about it, but I want you to look for them for yourself because um, basically in a nutshell, it's not particularly applicable in the UK because it's really applicable when temperatures start to get high. So probably UK summer, but other countries, you know, a lot, a lot more often. And when you're up towards 6,000 feet density altitude, which is very unlikely in the UK because we tend to fly around, you know, certainly less than 2,000 feet. But of course, in some places, particularly in the States, I guess, you're going to be up towards that. And it, some... MoGas is not happy um, at those heights. And also, MoGas doesn't store particularly well. So, for example, another thing that crossed my mind about some of these recent issues with, with gyroplanes uh, and whether there are engine problems, you know, if you've put your gyroplane away because of the lockdown in maybe March, April, and you haven't done very much, and then you suddenly bring it back out um, and do a flight, but you've still got a full tank, you know, so there's still old fuel in it. By the time you get to sort of November, you know, that fuel could be six months old. And MoGas that's six months old is definitely not at the same quality that it was when it was fresh. Same also applies. One thing that these documents start to highlight is that um, uh, automotive fuel changes spec from summer and winter. So obviously one of the motivations of the automotive fuel in the winter is that it's a bit more volatile so that it aids cold starting. But of course that volatility when you get to altitude or when it gets hot leads to what's known as vapor lock. And again, if you think about you know, a lot of these potential issues are in the winter with, with aircraft. Is that a winter fuel spec problem? I, the problem, I guess, is the fact that ultimately 
you know, investigating bodies find that difficult to find out because either the, you know, the wreckage is burnt out and there's no evidence or by the time they get to look at the fuel, the chemical, you know, it's not vapoured anymore. It's just gone back to a liquid and, and they just never know. And of course they try and start the engine and if they can and, and the thing runs fine, but actually there is a potential for a, for a, for a problem there. So take a look at that or go to the links um, in the description and you'll see the potential snags uh, that exist there. So, buyer's guide. One of the things, we covered this in the last webinar, and actually, to be truthful, that webinar is published. There's also a lot of published material anyway around the aircraft that I've given a view on. So if you're unsure, have a look at those again. But I would say this. <coughs> I've said, remember the old ball story. Now, if you're not sure what that means, just Google old ball and you'll get an answer on Google. But it basically relates to a young bull that saw Keen and Eager and wants to race down to the bottom field and have his way with uh, one, of the, uh, one of the cows that are there while the old bull just takes his time because he knows that he can have the entire paddock of cows at his leisure. And this is the thing with gyroplanes that I don't get. Very often we find ourselves in a situation where people are buying aircraft before they've even learned to fly. And I don't get it. I don't get it because aircraft are definitely easier to buy than they are to sell. They're one of these liquid things that may, depending on the time of year, depending on the economic general cycle, you could end up with a gyroplane stuck in your hangar for a long time before you find someone that wants to buy it and buy it at the price that you want to sell it at. The other problem is the cost of carry with a gyroplane is expensive. You've still got to insure it. You've still got to put it in a hangar because if you can't, you know, if you leave it out on a field like you see fixed wing, they just degrade and become, you know, worthless. Uh, and you've still got to get it maintained and still have the thing permitted because no one's going to buy, or they will, but they'll knock you on the price. You know, you still have a permit to fly. So there is no race to buy a gyroplane. What I suggest, and it is the, by far the thing that will probably keep you very safe, learn to fly, enjoy the flying training, enjoy the flying training in the aircraft that the instructor, whoever you've chosen to go with, is flying. Fly that well, learn that aircraft well, pass your test, and then at the end of that process, if you still enjoy it and you still think you're going to do more than realistically 30 or 40 hours a year then think about buying one if you're not going to do more than 30 or 40 hours a year it's probably cheaper to rent an aircraft than it is to buy one simply because the cost of the hangar the cost of the insurance and the cost of the the annual maintenance will exceed any kind of saving that you're going to have um, over over the the alternative of renting I noticed I've got a question here, so let's just have a look. Yes, exactly. If it floats or flies or is a woman of the night, then you should rent it. You're right. I mean, there is a, there is a lot to that, uh, Bob. Um, and as I say, I think the crossover point, it becomes interesting if you're going to do more than 30 or 40 hours a year. And don't forget, not just 30 or 40 hours a year, in the first year when you're the most keen, but 30 or 40 hours a year every day, you know, every year for five or six years, because th these things are not cheap anymore. I mean, I've just given some basics here. You know, you've got an M24 uh, from Magni, which is the side by side, looks like this. Uh, an M26, which is gonna be 
uh, Magnus version of a Calidus, which is a tandem enclosed. Uh, you've got Cavalon and, um, and Cavalon, and, and this is the Calidus. Um, I have to say, I'm not entirely sure that. Okay, so my quick, quick uh, synopsis of each model. M24 is the cockpit is quite cramped if you're a big guy. I mean, I'm five foot nine, two five foot nine guys fit in there fine. Uh, but if you're a six foot guy and with another six foot guy, you're probably going to struggle. Uh, the control forces are quite high, uh, but otherwise, it's a very solid, easy, easy thing to fly and will look after you. Uh, and they're actually quite cheap. As in terms of value, they're probably the best value for money side by side. Cavalon, I think, looks a bit better. Um, there's definitely more cockpit space, there's definitely more storage space. Um, but dynamically, control forces are a bit easier. You've also got roll trim, which you don't have in M24. Um, but otherwise, they're quite expensive and they do have little things that snag you. Like, so for example, in the engine bay of a, of a Cavalon, they've got a little ring of, of wire that's um, used for fire detection. So basically, if the wires burn and they lose their circuit, then it sets off an alarm in the, in the cockpit. I don't know whether they fix that problem, but early Cavalons used to constantly have fire warning alarms on, in the, on the dashboard. And of course, at some point, people are going to fly with that and there's going to be a real fire. And then how are you left? Calidus, by far and away, if you fly on your own without a passenger, that, that obviously means that's probably for me the nicest enclosed aircraft. They're fast, by far the fastest uh, gyroplane. Uh, they'll cruise at 100 plus miles an hour. Um, but they are a solo only aircraft. Sitting in the back for more than an hour in a Calidus, um, you'd rather do, you'd rather go to the dentist. They're, they're the most uncomfortable thing in the back. The snags with Calidus, mainly, if you watch my Calidus video review, it's the fuel tank debonds from the outer and you can't see what fuel state you've got anymore, which is super frustrating and not particularly helpful. Open aircraft, we've already seen the old style, where are we, where are we, where are we? Old style sport, that's a super reliable thing actually. Um, I've had a couple of those for, as an instructor and not being particularly, you know, they get worked hard and they've never let me down. I mean, that's, you know, if I was gonna buy a first gyroplane, I'd probably just get an MT-03 or an early 2010 Sport, as that is. Um, it's cheap, easy gyroplaning, really, especially with a 912. Magni, probably a better open aircraft, definitely more comfortable. You've definitely got more. You kind of sit in a Magni M16 rather than sit on top of a, a Sport. Um, the thing that I don't like about M16, <clears throat> and it's, A, it's just a little bit less dynamic. And I think once you can fly, you want things to be a little bit more edgy, for want of a better word, because stability just means a little bit boring. You know, if you're going to fly locally, you know, an, an hour and no more, I'd probably take a Sport over a, over an M16. If I was going places, I'd probably take an M16 over a Sport, if that makes sense. Um, the other thing that I don't like about M16, I don't like this rear, where it just looks a bit unfinished. Any, I mean, Bob, if you've got an M16, you'll know what I mean. You know, the, the silencer almost looks like there should be another bit, and they're just not bothered to put it on. And, and some of the way that the, the fuel filters and fuel pumps are, are just left. They're just it almost like needs a, a little cover over some of the bits just to finish it off, which they've just not done. I mean, it doesn't make it fly any, any, any less well, but just, just a bit nicer, I would think. Um, 
2017 Sport, actually, that's quite a nice aircraft. Um, that, it has got a bit heavier, so if you only end up with a 912, they're completely gutless. I mean, two up in a 912 2017 Sport um, on a UK summer uh, is going to lead to problems. They haven't sold very many in the UK like that, so thankfully, because I think there'd be a lot in the boundary fence if they had. I've flown quite a lot in this type with a 915, and I have to say, 915 engines, and it's interesting because I'm coming on to engines now, makes the huge, probably the single biggest difference of anything is the 915 engine. It's massive power. Although, as we saw earlier with that AR1 problem uh, accident, you've got to respect the power because if you don't, that can create its own problems. And a, and a quick rundown of these engines, 912 IS, I don't really think has any performance benefit over a ULS 912, but it's a lot more complicated. And I think for choice, if I were a simple uh, gyroplane, I'd take an old fashioned MTO Sport with a 912 Rotax, and that'll give you, you know, decades of service without any real snags. They have a few little leaks, uh, which are mainly seal related from the water pump housing and so on but otherwise these things will just go on forever and ever 914 i've actually seen quite a few with turbo related issues <clears throat> i know um there's a guy who's an instructor actually at uh, shobden with a calidus and he's a to my knowledge, I think he's had at least two turbo failures and one, he was very, very lucky because um, it happened in the circuit and he just happened to look and see the huge trail of um, oil smoke and, and he managed to land with the, you know, the engine still providing power and so on. But 914 can be flaky i'm not sure if it was a batch problem uh, or whether you know i don't even know whether it was an operator you know operating a particular way for a particular period of time that caused the problem but definitely uh there has been some reliability snags gyroplane wise with 914 um and as i say 915 is just it's too early really to say reliability wise but performance wise it's makes a huge difference in in a 2017 sport one with 915 you can pretty much get air ball and climb away from a dead stop to clear 50 feet um in in 100 meters to be honest i mean it's it, it's pretty impressive uh pretty impressive so gentlemen i think it is all gentlemen there's no ladies that's me done. Uh, any questions? Any? There is. Thanks, Nathan. So Nathan's saying, I don't know if you can, you should be all able to see actually the q and If you go in the, if you go in the Q&A, you'll be able to see the question, but I'll read it anyway. So uh, yeah, thanks Cameron. Uh, Nathan, I'm located in the States, looking at starting to fly and maybe on a gyrocopter for the first time next year. I like the utility of the AG915 from Air Gyro. Wanted to get your thoughts about it. And also, if you have a chance to look at their slightly bigger model, the Javelin, appreciate your thoughts on that. Any other advice appreciated? Right. Well, Nathan, happily, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll finish off with a small anecdote for you. A funny thing has happened with this air gyro aviation Novotnik or whatever they're called and so on and so forth. There's a huge, uh, Brian, yeah, you can. Uh, all of you, I'll send the, um, I'll get the video. No problem, Brian, no problem. Back to the air gyro. There's a guy called Alvaro, I think his name is. Um, he, I think he's a Polish guy and if you ever watch my channel, I'm sure you all do, you'll know that the content on there, I mean, look, 
just to backtrack, why the channel existed. It used to exist, and it's existed for a few years, mainly just some instructional tips and hints and blah, blah. It wasn't, I wasn't massively focused on it. Um, <clears throat> and it ticked along. But, you know, I had a few followers, you know, a few thousand followers, but nothing like it has now. And then as the lockdown came, all the actual flying stopped. And I thought, you know what? I've got, literally, I was doing nothing at, at home. And I thought, I'll, I'll make more of an effort with this channel. And, and it's grown. Anyway, part of the, the, the thing away from the, the pure instruction where I'm flying, and I am flying uh, maybe in the back seat and the students in the front in, in a lot of the videos. But of course, some of the, the safety videos, I'm never going to go and do that myself. For example, you know, we've all watched the air, um, the AR1 uh, fall out of the sky because we think pilot-induced oscillation, low G. I'm not going to fly that to demonstrate to the world what happens if you get into that eventuality. So what I do, I take clips off YouTube that I don't, and I don't really spend a lot of time looking for them. I, they tend to either come up as a suggestion because obviously I've looked for gyroplane related stuff before, or someone sent me a video link and they said, what do you think of this? In fact, while on the subject, I'll just show you one example of something uh, while I carry on my anecdote about air gyro. So one day I woke up and I'd got a, um, a, copyright strike on my YouTube channel, which means that someone's complained about the content. Anyway, what it was, I posted up a video of someone doing some wheel balancing uh, at Utah, ironically. Uh, I think in actual fact, it was the, the guy who initially trained this guy from the AR1. But anyway, I had a, he was then working for Alvaro and they'd made a complaint about um, they'd made a complaint about me using their bit of video, and he made me take it down. The next thing is then on the is I he then gets on an email explaining himself, and then he wants me to then fly his aircraft to do a review on the channel. And I said, well, hang on a minute, I'm happy to do that, but if we make some video, what I don't you know I, te I, I tweaked his tail a little bit and I. I said, I don't want you to have a copyright strike against it. But anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, the plan was I was going to go, I was invited to go to Poland um, in the autumn to fly an air gyro 915 because I'd taken the piss, for want of a better word, about the huge confusion about the same looking gyroplane by about six different names. And I was invited over there to, um, I was invited over there to, to have a go in one and to give my view. Uh, didn't happen because of the virus, obviously. But if you're just about to go into training, I would say that by the spring, summer next year, I'll have done that and I can give you a real view. In the meantime, if you contact me by email, Nathan, uh, and the email address is uh, this is my email address for anybody that cares. Oh my God. Uh, there you go. There's the email address. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Must be. Uh, gyro, it's gyrocopter flying club uh, at gmail.com. Send me an email. I've got another email address for somebody uh, that has done a lot of flying in these kind of aircraft. I don't, it might be called a Tursle. I don't know whether he's flown an AR, AG-15, but the same kind of things. And he'll give you a good view if, if you, you know, if my stuff um, doesn't work out for you in terms of its time scale. Anyway, last little thing here. I don't know whether any of you subscribe to a, a channel on YouTube called AvWeb. The, the guy's called Paul Bertarelli. I'll just play this quickly from the beginning. This is the channel. You, I'm sure there is the guy. You, you, I'm sure you've recognized that guy. He seems a nice guy, 
he actually seems quite knowledgeable generally about aviation. Um, but this thing popped up on my feed. And because I know some of you are in the States, I want you to, I want you to know this guy here. So there you go. Raul Salazar. Let's just play this to get to, let's just, I'll just play this a minute. There we go. Right. So Paul Bertarelli doesn't fly gyroplanes. He's in a demo flight with this guy, Raul Salazar. And I think, but I don't know, either this is an AG-15 or it's something similar from that family. Not that it's particularly relevant to what your question is, because I don't know what's happening here. But in a minute, we're going to watch this takeoff. And if anybody is in the States who flies with this guy, before you go any further with your training, you need to sit down with him or send him the link to this video. And he needs to explain what's happening here. Because I've got to say, bearing in mind this guy's an instructor and this Paul Bertarelli's Avweb channel is pretty well watched. I mean, I think he's put this video up about three or four days no about five days there's about fifty thousand views sit back and watch an instructor do a takeoff in this aircraft now it's not going to cruise anymore so we get a little power We'll get there in a minute. 180 is all you're going to get? Yeah, because he has a big photo. I think it's 190. So now we're released. Here we hit the brick. We're going. Keep it there. The RPMs are going to increase. So what's the center line? The bashing area. 206 is now that it's coming up. Well, there. To the north. Or power. The river will be in the area. Here we go. Oh, hello. For runway 823. What's going on here? So. I don't want to be too rude about this guy, but I'm not being funny. If you're the instructor and you can't hold the center line, how do you expect the student to do that? I mean, look, unsticks. Off right to the left wheel. Hello. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So, you know, nothing particularly, you know, like I say, nothing particularly uh, too stressful. But it does make you wonder, doesn't it, that this is a guy that's, I think he's a reasonably well-respected uh, instructor. I think he, he's down in Florida. Uh, and he's, I mean, I don't, I don't know him at all. Seems a nice enough guy, doesn't he? He's well-spoken and he, he obviously knows how to fly. But nevertheless... That was a fairly shabby uh, takeoff, and I'm not entirely sure if that's the the level of of instruction over in the states. I, I've got no idea, but I can tell you if you if you were a UK instructor and you'd done that on a, any kind of evaluation or reval, that would be some work to do there. Anyway, any more for any more? I think we've covered. All the questions. Any more chat? No more chat. In which case, thanks for your company. Uh, I hope you found it. Um, uh, ah, Bob's asking me, is this the end of Auto Gyro? Uh, Bob, I don't know whether you saw the first part of the film, but to be honest, I don't think it looks good for them. You know, I've got to say, I think, uh, I think it might well be. I don't know what I don't know what orders they've got in the pipeline. Um, I know that they've got um, some investment from the Middle East, and let's be honest, you know, if someone desperately wants to keep it going, then 
you know, for sure there's people in those countries that could spend to all intents and purposes on limited funds, um, keeping it going. But, you know, when you, when you go back to, and, I, and I, I'll just quickly go back to this um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, I did nothing more sophisticated than a, a quick uh, look at G info, which we all did together. And that's the UK sales. Now, I don't think the UK is the biggest market for Autogyro because it's been neglected so much. But bearing in mind, that's where the CEO comes from. Uh, you can't not sell aircraft for that length of time and continue um, in any kind of meaningful way. And I think the real, the real sad thing about it is there's some good guys there. I mean, I did, um, I used to be, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't kept it going, but I used to be authorized for heavy maintenance on Autogyro. Um, and the guy there was called uh, Bartlett, Michael Bartlett, which always made me laugh actually, because if you remember the film, um, I don't know if it was a cold it story, actually, they, Herr Bartlett, good luck, Herr Bartlett, um, and he gets caught. And, of course, he's a Brit. He's actually a British guy, but he's got the surname Bartlett. He's a super nice guy, and, you know, I don't know whether he's going to be one of the people they're going to let go or, or what. I haven't spoken to him, actually. But, yeah, I, I just don't see how they're going to carry on because, you know, who's going to put – who on earth, if you imagine – uh, a 2017 Sport or a Cavalon. Cavalon must be, it's got to be $130,000, $150,000 uh, US, 100000 sterling, a bit more. And who's going to put 30% down the deposit with a company that's in that situation? It's just not going to happen. I mean, you'd be insane to, to do that, completely insane. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, and the economy, I mean, look, Bob, you've probably heard the news today. A lot of people now back in lockdown in the UK. People are locked down in France. People are locked down in Germany. The States, I guess, there's going to be some form of, of lockdown. And when all this is over, people's focus is not necessarily going on where we're going to go fly. It's going to be on rebuilding their business or keeping their job or whatever. Yeah, it's a terrible... I mean, it is a terrible general economic situation, but for sure uh it's been badly neglected that business because um they've grown very quickly to satisfy certain orders um they also went down a massive uh, dead end with they, they persistently try to make these things commercially viable you know as commercial aircraft and there's no work for them in a commercial context not really because the, the, what, the problem they've got from a commercial, when they push the commercial uh, route with Gyroplane, is that all the people that are in positions to deal with those kind of contracts typically come from a military background. So, you know, they're ex-military helicopter pilots or ex-military fixed-wing pilots. And so that's where they gravitate to. And, of course, the other problem with the Gyroplane, it's got no payload. I mean, for example... If you look at uh, Cavalon, Cavalon, when, oh, sorry, I'm just, I haven't shared my screen, have I? If you look at Cavalon, for example, Cavalon is about 320 kilos empty. So put fuel in it, it becomes, to all intents and purposes, uh, 400 kilos if you fill it, fill it full of fuel. And so now you've got 160 kilos left of, you know, because it's 560 kilos maximum all at weight. Well, you know, you put two guys in it and, and you're done. What, what, you know, you're not going to carry any, you're not going to carry anything. You're not going to even. We looked at when I was in Qatar. We, I was the, I was the chief instructor for the Coast Guard because they use gyroplanes 
uh, to support their boats in the Coast Guard and they use them for border security. We were speaking to Autogyro back in 2018 about fitting you know, a thermal imaging infrared camera to the front of a sport. First of all, it took them months and months to even engage because they were just clueless. I mean, literally from a service point of view, cl clueless. And then they then wanted us to pay some ridiculous amount of money to do a whole bunch of development work. Well, we were under a military uh, authorization. So we, were, we, you know, we didn't need any civilian authorization for the aircraft to be airworthy. We were just, we were effectively part of the military. And they just didn't, they just, I don't know. I just, yeah, you're right. It'll be sad if they go, but it wouldn't surprise me. And I, and I, and I can, and I can see it happening, to be honest. I can really see it happening. Anyway, guys, I'm glad you have enjoyed. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. We'll have a, I'll, I'll look forward to that, Bob. I very much look forward to that. And, um, <laughs> well, when we do go flying, Bob, um, when you come to Tour Western, we've got an M24 we can use and um, we'll go flying in the M24 and you can show me, uh, you can show me all the skills. Anyway, guys, thanks for all the time. Thanks for the support of the channel. I'm sorry that some of this has been all doom and gloom, but I, you know, it's just the timing of things. And um, I suppose Merry Christmas if uh, if we're going to have one. I know some of us in the UK are not. Christmas is being cancelled, but uh, you, we can't see our families. But I'm sure we'll get through it, and um, hopefully, at better weather in the spring, and we can all do a whole bunch of flying. In the meantime, keep watching the channel. Hopefully, we won't be reporting on any more doom and gloom for a while. Um, and if you have any interest in flying films, by the way, that, you know, just genuinely send them over. And I, mean, I don't want to rip them apart, but, you know, just for, just for something that's not, not all doom and gloom, maybe some nice scenery. And I can put that on the channel. And uh, I promise, you know, if that's the context that we're using it for, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to, I'm not going to rip you apart on it. Anyway, nice to see you all. Have a nice Christmas and keep watching. Take care.